remember uh, when we left last time, we had skipped ahead in the section on obesity and diabetes. We talked about the physiology of diabetes and how um, an energy imbalance seems to contribute to a disruption of insulin signaling. And you got to see those really, um, really enlightening animations that Dr. Kane's old PhD advisor made that uh, show the electron transport chain, electrons being transported, and then protons being pumped. That is um, the basis of energy production in the cell, and we think of it sort of in the context of obesity or diabetes as the sink that's filling up. You can unplug the drain, which is exercise, to clear out some of the, uh, the backup of energy. Um, you can have the faucet on full blast. Uh, energy intake or food intake is high, then you're trying to um, overload the sink in that case. So the analogy is the sink. Um, a healthy balance would be the drainage matches the amount of water being input, and that's what we're talking about today, energy balance or water balance in that sink. So how would the accrual of energy gradually result in uh, obesity and hence diabetes? And the key is gradually. It's a spectrum disorder like modern chronic disease, which was part of the midterm. One of the first questions on the midterm. Modern chronic disease, uh, it's a spectrum disorder. It's progressive. It's incurable. It's multifactorial. It's controllable can't have any one cure, but there's a progression from some normal point over on the left-hand side. We'll call this normal weight in quotes. Whatever that happens to be, we're not assigning a number to it. And then as that weight increases for a given person or a population towards being obese, or now we have new categories. We used to end at morbidly obese. Now they're super obese with a BMI of over uh, 40 or 50 kilograms per meter squared. And I know BMI is not the best way to qualify obesity, but it's an easy measure to make. There's some spectrum. People don't just end up on the right-hand side of the scale magically. They don't wake up one day on the right-hand side of the scale. It's a progressive spectrum. And this spectrum of weight in blue tends to mirror a spectrum of diseases in red. And that's not to say that as body weight increases, you will automatically contract or develop new conditions according to a program, but our observations say that they tend to exist together. The incidence of these diseases, high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, uh, depression, dementia and Alzheimer's, certainly diabetes, all tend to go up when you uh, push or find yourself traveling further to the right on this scale. And so it's in everyone's best interest to try to understand where they are on this scale and hopefully move back towards the left or a normal, healthy living situation. You can move towards normal weight. You can move towards overweight. And it's a gradual accumulation of day after day lifestyle choices that will push you one way or the other. One step forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. They're only sequential steps. You don't take leaps and bounds to jump uh, forward or back. Even though diabetes cures is the end of our outline that we saw last class. We'll see that today. There might be some larger leaps and bounds that we can take, but generally it's sequential or progressive. And it has a lot to do with this idea of energy balance. If you fill the sink up too much and you store a lot of water, you store a lot of energy, you are tipping the scales in favor of consumed calories, eating more. If you open up the drain and expend a lot of energy, drain a lot of water, you're tipping the scale in favor of more exercise, greater physical activity, and uh, a negative energy balance. And so a lot of people end up lost in the question whether one's more important than another. Should I focus on just uh, increasing daily physical activity? Should I diet? My diet doesn't work. You need both to happen. And it's not really the goal of this course to say one is better than the other. I think what this is going to highlight is that both will provide you options. And how you tip the scale is really a personal decision. It's a personal choice. It's what fits your lifestyle best.
no diet in the history of mankind has not also included a calorie deficit or a negative energy balance. I have friends that are really big into a keto diet um, or Atkins diet or uh, what's the other one now? Paleo diet. All of them necessarily also tend to include you eating less, which is why most of them tend to be um, somewhat successful. But whether you gravitate towards one or the other doesn't mean that it's right or it's wrong. It's that it works better for you. I lost a lot of weight in uh, second or third year university by just counting calories. My mind works in a weird way where I like to make spreadsheets and I like to do math and I see the progress and it's a ton of work. But that spoke to me. That worked for me. And then I put it back on when I moved here and then I lost a lot of weight last winter just stopping eating after 5 or 6 p.m. That was easy. Super easy to do. Didn't have to worry about calculating anything. Just did it. And now it's part of my lifestyle. It just worked for me. Some people will have a high fat, low carb diet and that works for them. Some people love to exercise avidly, fanatically, and that works for them. If you do both, you have the option to affect both sides of this balance rather than one. Maybe it's easier to exercise a bit and diet a bit, but it's a personal endeavor. It's a personal choice. So I'm not going to say that one's better than the other. What I'm getting across in this section is uh, to move leftwards on the scale, you need to decrease the left-hand side and increase the right. To move rightwards on that last spectrum, the opposite is true. What we're going to look at is how to calculate or how to assess these blocks. There's a whole degree here that really focuses on assessing this purple block, the calories consumed. And to synthesize it down into one slide, this is how we can calculate the size, the magnitude, or the volume of that purple block. The food that you eat has a certain caloric content. If you kept track of all the foods that you eat, like I've done, which is really taxing and difficult, you could add up all the grams of fat, carbohydrates, and protein. You can calculate calories of each. You could simply calculate or keep track of the uh, nutritional impact, uh, the nutritional facts on all the foods that you eat and come up with a sum tally for the day. Total number of kilocalories taken in on the left-hand side of that balance. These are generally fixed. Protein and carbohydrates all have four kilocalories per gram. If you could take one gram, that would be the equivalent of four kilocalories of energy. Fat has a range, seven to nine, because it depends on how you define fat. Triglycerides, three fats with a glycerol backbone. If you just look at the free fatty acids, seven kcals per gram. If you also include the glycerol, the backbone portion, nine kcals per gram. Do you use all of that? Do you, do you use the entire free fatty or the, the entire triglyceride? No, not in uh, an easy um, easy to define sense. There's, they're always in flux. We, we saw that last, uh, last class briefly. So seven to nine kcals per gram in that range. Fat's more calorie dense than the other two, but we're not exactly sure what the value is, at least for our points of view. You add all those up, you should come up with a total um, caloric content that matches the individual sum totals of those macronutrients. So it's easy to figure out the left-hand side of that balance. Yeah. Um, Very good. All three together. Yeah. And if you all three together, and then if you want to think about it a bit more in depth, that answer isn't even as clear as I'm giving it to you now because free fatty acids are of different lengths. And the length relates to how much energy is contained in that fat. So a really long fatty acid that might be 20 carbons long has more energy than a 12 carbon fatty acid. So even then the answer is not so simple. So I'm just going to say 7 kcals per gram for all three fatty acids on a triglyceride. If you throw in the glycerol, it's 9. We're going to use 7 uh, when we come back to this calculation later. Um, if you want to err on the high side, you can use 9. And it doesn't matter. 
somewhere in this range, this isn't a, a major point that we're going to focus on too much. This is nutrition's domain. But we have a general understanding of how we can calculate that purple block, calories in. Calories out is a bit more difficult. For one, there's three blocks. There's resting metabolic rate, there's unstructured physical activity, and then there's exercise. And the sad news is that exercise probably takes up the smallest percentage of calories out. It has the smallest effect on that balance. But it is the thing that we are best able to control. Structured exercise can uh, consume a lot of energy if we get into the habit of doing it. And the amount of energy we can easily measure. In endurance type activity, steady state activity, every liter of oxygen that you consume represents about five kilocalories of energy expended. So for any sport that you're doing, if you could measure VO2, the volume of oxygen consumed, you can roughly calculate the energy expended during that activity because it's roughly equating to about five kcals per liter. If you know the rate of oxygen consumption, and then you figure out how long you're doing that activity, you could then theoretically calculate, well, how much oxygen did I use in total? 120 liters in total. Well, the total oxygen times 5 kcals per liter of oxygen would give you the total energy expended. For example, we don't know if this number makes a lot of sense, but if I consumed four liters in the past, I don't know, two, three minutes, that would equate to 20 kcals uh, of energy expended. Whatever the activity was for however long I did it, if I consumed four liters, it would represent 20 kcals. It's as simple as making that calculation, liters times five. That will get you in the ballpark. But in lab, you'll see this week, we want to drill down a bit more specifically, get a bit more detail, and I'll go through an example of that today. So just a brief refresher, why does oxygen consumed correlate with energy expended? For that, we've got to take a trip back down to the electron transport chain. It's not that oxygen consumed translates directly into energy expected, uh, expended. Oxygen consumed, you can see here, oxygen is uh, reduced to water, and that directly creates that gradient, the gradient in the mitochondria. The gradient relates to the amount of energy that's produced to, uh, to participate in an activity. So there is a step in the middle, but generally this is a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a little bit of leak, but if you create the gradient, it will be used to make ATP when required. When required. There's a couple links in this chain. It's easy to ballpark, 5 kcals per liter, but let's walk this through in a stepwise manner. If I'm exercising... I'm using the ATP that I have inside my muscles, in my body. If I use that much ATP, I need to replace it. So I'm assuming that I can replace it at an adequate rate, or that I replace it in a one-to-one -one manner. I fully replace the ATP that I'm using. If that happens, which it does, does oxygen consumption equal the production of ATP. Well, looking at this graph over here, if the gradient doesn't disappear, yes, that will happen. If ATP formation equals ATP use, and then the oxygen consumed equals ATP formation, we can get rid of ATP formation from that equation and just say, okay, we can circumvent the middle person, O2 consumption equals ATP use or energy expended. So when you make the measurement in lab with the mask or the mouthpiece, VO2 is oxygen consumed, you can roughly equate that 
to energy expended during that activity. And that holds up pretty well. Any observation that we've made shows that this is generally the case. Um, you know, indirect calorimetry equal parallel direct calorimetry uh, pretty tight, pretty nicely. So, when you make this measurement and you ballpark energy expended, for the most part, it holds up. And we've designed lab in a way that it will always hold up because you're doing moderate intensity activity. Where this falls apart a little bit are when these are not connected perfectly. A situation where they're not connected perfectly would be if the leak is ever larger than normal. Um, thermogenesis in, uh, in environmental ex-phys next semester, I typically talk, talk about non-shivering thermogenesis. You might have heard of brown fat or cold adaptation. It's a, a new striking way that people are thinking might help uh, um, counteract obesity. It's essentially wasting the gradient. This falls apart if the gradient doesn't uh, make ATP. And it's also really difficult to measure if you're doing sprints, repeated sprint-like activity, on, off, on, off, on, off. Steady state exercise is what we use and uh, what we assume is, um, is the case where this assumption will hold up. So for the rest of lecture and then for lab, we're talking about steady state exercise. You might see something that looks like this on a trace in your, uh, in your notes or when you get the printout in lab. Exercise at a moderate intensity, a light jog, a bike ride, would look like this. From a resting situation, as you start to exercise, your VO2 will creep up. It will eventually reach a plateau, and that represents matching of ATP formation and ATP use. This is why VO2 can tell us how much energy is being expended. You match in steady state ATP formation and ATP use. And for our measurements in lab, what we'll typically do, this is only 12 minutes, but we'll use this as an example. Imagine this is an hour or two hours or four hours for some research studies. What we'll typically do is if the exercise is constant, we'll make a couple different measures three, four, five measurements, we'll get whatever the VO2 value is at these intermittent time points, we'll figure out what the average is for the time that you're exercising, and then you can calculate, well, if this is the average VO2 or the rate that oxygen is consumed, if I know how long it's being consumed for, the shaded area represents a total amount of oxygen that was the cost of that exercise. So I can take three values, maybe, maybe this is 1.1 liters per minute. It's 1.1 liters per minute over a total of nine minutes. So in total, what's that, about 10 liters of oxygen? 1.1 times nine, 9.9. .9. 10 liters of oxygen. So not knowing anything more, could you ballpark the caloric cost of this exercise for me? 50, absolutely. About 50. Uh, and this is using just three equally spaced points, figuring out the average cost of exercise for nine minutes in total, 50 kcals. If I look at each of the individual points, like I did before class, and I add them up, it's 50.75. So pretty good approximation. 50 kcals, if we use three points and average it, if we count all the individual dots, 50.75 kcals, if we're being specific. So pretty good approximation. And this is what you're going to do in lab to assess the, um, the, the caloric expenditure during walking and running in various different exercise stages. You're going to have a trace that looks like this over some indeterminate amount of time, and you're going to take a couple points during the exercise, figure out an average 
and then for however long you were doing that exercise, calculate the oxygen consumed. This works really well for steady state exercise where VO2 is relatively stable. And I made this vary a little bit because VO2 does vary a little bit in practice, but overall it's pretty much consistent. How do we get a better, a more accurate uh, calculation, more accurate number of liters of oxygen consumed? This is, this is a very general average. The next step towards a more accurate uh, depiction of the oxygen consumed would be, well, let's not make one square. What if I broke it down? What if I took the first half of exercise and I took a couple different points in the first half, figured out that average, a couple points in the second half and figured out that average, and if I add those two together, I have a slightly more accurate determination of the oxygen consumed. That's the first step. Then the tenth step, the, the most accurate way that we can do, would be to take these really small individual slices. If we had a machine that could measure on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, we could look at what's the VO2 right away at the start. What is it shortly afterwards? What is it at 10-second intervals or 20-second intervals? And then maybe... I could figure out what the area is for each of these squares, add up all of these squares, and get a really nice, accurate picture of the oxygen consumed during exercise. That's certainly more accurate. In practice, it doesn't really matter. In practice, if you can calculate the O2 consumed, you can calculate the energy used during exercise. The big difference between these few examples that we've looked at is this little area at the start, which we're going to talk about shortly. Most, for, for most of the part during exercise, these, these numbers are all in the same range. We're just getting slightly different flavors of the same average. This small section provides a bit of a problem, but generally it's a fraction of the exercise cost. And I'll show you that we can ignore that later. But first, let's do an example. So 50 uh, kcals was one that we got from that first example. Let's do one that's a bit more in-depth using numbers you might get in lab, for instance. Energy expenditure. Energy as we measure it is in kcals. Using some more information that we get from gas collection, we, we don't have to stop just at kcals. We can look at the, uh, the distribution or breakdown of fat and carbs within that total energy expenditure. And this is probably review for a lot of you from XFIS, but the actual energy expenditure depends on the substrate mix. That is, what mix of fuels are you using to accomplish that work? The caloric equivalent is another name for that. Caloric equivalent is highlighted here, the kcals per liter of O2. But I thought you just said it's about 5. Well, yeah, it's true. It is about 5. At any point in this column, if you look, the number is pretty close to 5. If you had to round it to the nearest integer, you'd always round to 5. But depending on where you fall in this list, it might be 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, slightly above 5. Depending on where you are in this list, you get slightly more or less energy for every liter of O2 consumed. What dictates the amount of energy that you can harvest or garner from every liter of O2? If you are weighted towards oxidizing more carbohydrate, this is the the high test, high octane fuel, you're at the top of this list and you can receive a slightly larger amount of energy for every liter of O2 consumed. If you are focused more on fat oxidation for whatever reason, your body chooses to oxidize fat, you get slightly less energy for every liter of O2. And you've seen these numbers before, between 4.7 and 5, 
What I'm describing to you is the respiratory exchange ratio, or RER, which varies between 0.7 and 1, and that describes the mix of fat and carbohydrates in the air, be, or uh, not in the air, the mix of fat and carbohydrates being used to accomplish that work, being used to make ATP. While we have this really wide spectrum from 0.7 to 1. It's rare that anyone will ever be at the ends. Or if they are, it might just be initially. And then they'll come back down into the middle range. And maybe they'll change, their RER will change over time as they exercise. And that's certainly the case. The mixture of substrates varies widely. Respiratory exchange ratio is typically somewhere in the middle, and you can push it down or you can push it up depending on the type of exercise that you choose to do, but it's not static. Still, we are going to boil down the exercise you do in lab to one or two numbers. We're going to make it static because it's easier to calculate when it is static might fluctuate, you'll notice, when you're looking at the, uh, the metabolic heart, and that's totally normal. But just like you can figure out an average VO2, you're going to figure out an average RER for the exercise you're doing over however long you're doing it. You take three or four samples, you can average the VO2, you can average the RER, and then let's say over the course of an hour, you're not going to exercise for an hour, but if you did on your own and you had a metabolic cart, let's say you made this measurement. You exercised for one hour, your VO2 averaged 1.5 liters of oxygen per minute, and your RER was right in the middle of the range at 0 0.86. So we're looking at this line in the caloric equivalent tables highlighted in green. Well, with this, this should be... This should not be abnormal looking information. This should be data you would expect to get from the metabolic cart, right? You've seen average VO2 and average RER before. But what can we do with this information now? What, what you're going to calculate in lab is energy consumed and gram amounts of fat and carbs that are represented by this exercise. So let's say that you exercise for 60 minutes at an average of 1.5 liters of oxygen per minute. Well, just like that first example, that represents some total amount of oxygen. In this case, if I'm consuming 1.5 liters per minute, and I do that for 60 minutes, that's 90 liters of oxygen. Well, you can already ballpark what the caloric equivalent or the, uh, the energetic cost is. It's about 5 times 90. But we can do a better job because we also have the RER. RER of 0.86, if you consult the table, says that every liter of oxygen represents 4.875 kcal. Smarter people that came before us took the time to figure this out with the mixture of fat and carbohydrates to say that based on the relatively <coughs> equal contribution of both fuel sources, it's not 5, it's close to 5, but it's more specifically 4.875 kilocalories for every liter of oxygen consumed. Well, if I have 90 liters... And each one of those represents 4.875 kcals. It's a pretty easy calculation to figure out the total number of kcals expended. 438 and 3 quarter kilocalories. In one hour of exercise. Now, notice if you're keeping track and you did the, the mental math in your mind, this is pretty close to... 450, which is what you would have gotten had you said it's about 5 kcal. So we're, we're pretty close. This is more specific. We have a really accurate representation of the energy uh, expended during this exercise. What else can we get from this caloric equivalent table? Not only do we get a more precise 
value for calories per liter of O2, but we get a, um, uh, the, the mix of substrates is defined for us. We have the percentage of carbohydrates and the percentage of fat contributing to this total caloric equivalent. In our case, 54% of this energy is due to the oxidation of carbohydrates. So I take 54% of 438.75, that is 237.4 kcals, due to the oxidation of carbohydrates. I'll come back to that next number in a second. And the remainder is due to the oxidation of fat. Protein doesn't normally provide energy in these situations. It's usually reserved for uh, moments of crisis like starvation. We don't use that typically for energy during exercise. Fat and carbohydrate are our two main fuel sources. So if 54.1% is due to the oxidation of carbohydrates, 45.9, and if you add those up, you get 100. 45.9 is due to the oxidation of fat, 201 kcals of that total 438 kcals. So we have a really specific understanding of the cost of exercise in this case. Now the other numbers in these brackets, how did, how did I get those? Any clue? Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. The definition of uh, energy contained within carbohydrates or fat, we, we put out at the onset, there's four kcals per gram of carbohydrate. I'm using seven kcals per gram of fat. And so the energy that I, um, that I expended from my carbohydrate and fat sources is equivalent to 59.3 grams of carbohydrate and 28.8 grams of fat. That energy expended these gram amounts of fat and carbs, which is about the equivalent of a quarter pounder at McDonald's. Total kcals is just north of 500. Total fat, 28 grams, so about the same. Total carbohydrates, where is it? Way over here. 40 something, so a little bit less than what you would spend in an hour. So an hour's worth of exercise at a light to moderate pace is one quarter pounder at McDonald's. This is how I like to think of exercise. It's a one-to-one -one exchange. Do an hour of exercise, now I can eat a, a Big Mac or a quarter pound. Obviously don't. I mean, that's not the best way to approach exercise in a healthy lifestyle, but putting it in real terms for you. Two Mars bars or a quarter pound, or whatever your vice of choice is. So we get really specific numbers. Are those numbers accurate? And I'll just say yes, they are, but it's worth exploring how they might be wrong. What I pointed out initially, this little slice or sliver over on the left-hand side of this graph, this is, this is also VO2 over time, but it's a stylized cartoon at this point is what we call O2 debt. And O2 debt is energy that had to be borrowed to accomplish the exercise. So in your moderate light jog that you did for an hour, or your light bike ride that you did for an hour that we just went through the calculations for, VO2 might look something like this. It doesn't turn on right away. In fact, it takes a minute or two to ramp up. You'll remember from XFIS, when you measured steady state, you did it after two minutes at a given stage, right? Because it took a while for VO2 to level out. And so if we are calculating the energetic cost of exercise based on average VO2 over a given amount of time, well, VO2 isn't at that level in the first few minutes. Yet, we're still doing the work. It's not that you have to, when you start to run, you don't have to walk faster, walk faster, 
do a light jog, and then start running, you don't have to gradually ramp up the workload. The workload is there. You're starting the exercise at the intensity that you want, but VO2 is not yet able to satisfy the energetic demands. So that energy has to come from somewhere, and you'll remember from XFIS that it comes from phosphocreatine or uh, substrate level uh, phosphorylation, glycolysis, anaerobic glycolysis for lack of a better term. This is part of the cost of exercise, but it's very difficult to measure. And so the way that we get around that is we say, if the exercise is steady, and then the oxygen that I consume is steady later on, I'm just going to assume that VO2 would have been consistent the entire time and then calculate total liters of oxygen for the entire exercise as if it were ramped up at the start. There is a way that you can figure out what O2 debt is if you know the efficiency of the person and the workload, the external workload of the exercise, but I'm not gonna get into that detail right now. People are inherently inefficient and variable, but there is a way to do it. We're going to assume um, the average VO2 over time is, is good enough. And for the most part, this is such a small fraction. This is in, uh, enlarged here on this graph. It doesn't say how long this exercise is, but imagine that this is 10 minutes. This is a small fraction of 10 minutes, and if you're exercising for an hour, the graph is way over here in the hallway. And relatively, this proportion is very, very small. It doesn't take away from the total oxygen consumption very much. So we can typically acknowledge that it's there, but not worry about calculating it. I was going to say ignore it, but I think that's a better way to describe it. So we have this little blip that represents the anaerobic contribution to exercise, the non-oxygen dependent contribution to exercise. I'm not a fan of anaerobic, and I won't go off on a rant why. But. That's Initially, it was thought to be balanced by the purple slice on the uh, right-hand side of this graph. EPOC, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. We just say EPOC, if you uh, bring it out long, long form, the name tells you exactly what it is. It's oxygen that's being consumed in excess of what is required once exercise is done. It was originally thought that this was paying back O2 debt. That whatever energy we had to borrow at the start to do the exercise had to be repaid afterwards. And it was repaid by this higher than normal oxygen consumption. And then when it eventually tapered off, whatever the area was here under the, uh, the purple banner would have matched the O2 debt at the onset. But that's not the case at all. It was a nice idea. This is always bigger. Epoch is always bigger. And it's bigger if the exercise is more intense. It's bigger if the exercise is longer. And what this really represents is a return to normal, a correction of the disturbance in homeostasis of exercise. It's not as easy as just resynthesizing phosphocreatine. It involves uh, restoring ion balance, Sodium potassium ATPase takes energy. It involves pumping calcium. Calcium ATPase takes energy. It involves uh, constricting arteries and arterioles. Any muscle contraction takes energy. And if you're doing this uh, during exercise in the vasculature, that is a demanding process. The muscles of breathing are using energy as well. You need to be able to resynthesize glycogen, which is an energy-consuming process. All of these things are going on after the fact in recovery from exercise to return to normal. 
and oxygen consumption is elevated as a result. So it's not a direct one-to-one -one matching. As poetic as that would be, wouldn't it be nice if that were the case? We borrowed energy from phosphocreatine. We paid it back really quickly after exercise. It would be really nice and clean if that were the case. But it's not. There's other stuff on there. This is also part of the cost of exercise. It's greater than O2 debt, so you can't use it interchangeably. And maybe the cost of exercise isn't, isn't the best way to think of it. Think of it as a consequence of exercise or an added benefit of participating in exercise. Have you got a question? Yeah. yeah? This slide you posted online tells me that the results of the body heat is not part of the um, of exercise. But oh, so that's wrong. Okay. So yeah, this is, this is more correct. The slide that I posted is not how I'm approaching the lesson in this year's class. So when, when I did write that online, it's not part of the aerobic cost of exercise. So if you were to measure VO2 at the smallest infinite slices and then add those slices up to figure out what the aerobic cost of exercise was, you'd never include O2 debt. But it represents energy that had to be expended to get the work done. It's just not aerobic. It comes from elsewhere. That's a great catch. Thank you very much for pointing that out. So just make sure that you address that correction. You can either say not part of the aerobic cost of exercise on the slides, or you can say it's part of the total cost of exercise as we're looking at it today. I find it's easier or less complicated to wrap it up in the cost of exercise because it's relatively small and it's easier to make the calculation when you can average VO2 over a given amount of time and figure out total liters of O2 consumed. Yeah. Would you say that if it's on added benefit? Yes, so, so now when we leave O2 debt behind and we look at EPOC, this is more of a consequence of exercise. This is a necessary um, increase in expenditure to return your body to normal and recover. And this indicates that there's energy being consumed. You don't have to exercise to get it. And so it's somewhat of a bonus. If you're thinking of, I need to exercise to expend energy so that I'm in energy balance. If you exercise really hard, and then you have this period afterwards where you're still expending energy, well, hey, I'm not cycling, I'm not running, this is just happening, so it's kind of a bonus if you think about it that way. It will always follow exercise. The size will change. We'll talk about that coming up. But it's, it's somewhat of an added bonus. It's a consequence of engaging in exercise. So when we think about this balance, what we're interested in is everything, all the shaded areas. That represents energy that was consumed to accomplish our exercise task. If we were to just assess the aerobic cost of exercise, on our first example, we'd have to acknowledge that we're alive. At rest, there is a basal metabolic rate. And this orange rectangle at the bottom is meant to represent that. The exercise stimulus itself is over and above whatever the normal processes in the, bodies, uh, in the body are that need to sustain normal function. The aerobic cost of exercise would be everything shaded by this blue square. We are exercising, VO2 ramps up. Anything over and above the cost of living, which is the, uh, the orange rectangle, would be the added cost of exercise, the aerobic cost of exercise. But being that we are free living individuals and exercise has certain consequences, the total effect of exercise includes the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption and because we can do the exercise right away when we start, we don't have to gradually ramp up. There's some 
unknown amount of energy that we had to borrow from phosphocreatine and glycolysis in order to accomplish that work at the beginning before VO2 was able to satisfy that workload. Those two additions represent the total cost of exercise. And that's our focus. That's what we're going to focus on, the total cost of exercise in the lab and in class and in the context of energy balance. So when we use exercise to tip the scales in favor of an energy deficit, we want to make this area as big as possible. Exercising more is simply consuming more oxygen, making this area as big as possible. And making that area as big as possible is dependent on the intensity and duration of the activity you choose to do. So a really light exercise shown in the top here might have normal resting VO2 on the bottom. This light blue area is VO2 increasing to some steady state, which is a light to moderate workload. We still see O2 deficit. We see a small epoch on the right hand side. I didn't introduce this term before, but you're seeing this referred to as O2 debt. I find that it's, it's um, to me, it's confusing. O2 debt and O2 deficit are, are two things that are hard to keep track of. So I only think of epoch after exercise and O2 deficit initially. Um, those things here are small because the exercise is relatively light. And if I decide to exercise at a higher intensity, something where I might not even be able to reach a steady state, if I can do that exercise for as long as I did the short exercise, notice the increased volume of work being done or the increased volume of oxygen being consumed. The total cost of exercise in the top, if I can try to shade it in, is this light bluish oblong polygon type shape. I don't know how to describe that. And in the bottom, it's I'm going to use an orange uh, shaded rectangle here. Now, if I just take both of those out and I compare them one to the other, you can clearly see the higher intensity exercise has a larger area, meaning the cost of exercise is great. More oxygen was consumed or more energy was expended, created a larger energy deficit. So the total cost of exercise is proportional to intensity. You can also imagine it would be proportional to the duration. If you took this top example only, but you did it for twice as long, the longer duration exercise would also have a higher uh, or a larger shaded area. So it's easy to see on this uh, cartoon that a more intense exercise is uh, more costly. On a trace that you might get in lab, we can see something very similar. So this is, again, moderate intensity exercise compared to higher intensity exercise, maybe stage one and stage two um, of the type of exercise you'll do in lab. If we look at how we would calculate this, there's the shaded blue area versus the shaded orange area. Comparing those two, clearly the second exercise is more costly, more energy is expended. I don't think that's a surprise. If you exercise harder, you're going to use more energy. If you exercise longer, you're going to use more energy. But in practice, you don't often just do that. They are somewhat mutually exclusive. Uh, a more intense exercise is generally something that you can't handle as long as a moderate intensity exercise. You can't sprint as long as you would run a marathon. That's the, um, the essence of our comparison in lab this week. If you're walking one kilometer versus running one kilometer, the distance is fixed. If you travel the distance twice as quickly, the exercise duration is half as long. Which one of these is bigger? 
That's interesting. Any thoughts on which one might be bigger, running versus walking? You're doing the same amount of work. You're just doing it faster in one case. Any ideas? I, that's, that's how I would argue it, too. Absolutely. Same amount of work being done, I would think they'd be the same. Sure, VO2 is going to be higher, but it's not at high for as long, and it drops back down to resting, hopefully, as quickly. Same amount of work, I think, the same total oxygen consumption. Do you have a, a conflicting opinion? Oh, I was just going to say that it's because it is a higher amount of VO2 that yeah. it It stops before the walking is done, yeah. Yeah, like you reach a higher amount of VO2. Yep. Then it's it ends earlier. Higher amount, but ends earlier. And the question is which one of those has the largest impact? Maybe, because we just talked about how um, EPOC scales. With more intense exercise, the disturbance is greater, so maybe it takes longer to recover after a run. Maybe that pushes running over and above walking. Similar idea down here? I saw a couple hands out of the corner of my eye, but similar idea? Yeah. Same amount of work, not done in the same way. So I'm going to spoil the results of lab for you and show you a study at a University of Syracuse that did just, uh, just this comparison. Walking versus running, track versus treadmill as well, which is kind of interesting. Men versus women. So this is total energy expenditure for 1.6 kilometers, not one kilometer. Walking and running, men and women, track and treadmill. And what you're going to see on here, the first thing I think that's important is there's absolutely no difference between track and treadmill or men or women. Men or women, the bars are relatively equal. Track and treadmill, if you compare the left side versus the right side, there's really no difference. This, this black bar on the left, you can overlay with the black bar on the track side. Hatch bar, hatch bar. You can overlay both of those. Men and women are also not significantly different, which is pretty interesting. No differences between track and treadmill. No differences between men and women. This is um, relative energy expenditure, by the way. Kilojoules per kilogram. You'd expect heavier people, it would cost more to move them around. Lighter people, it would cost less. So when you standardize that, just like relative VO2, mils per kilogram per minute, we eliminate that error. Before we go too far, this is kind of interesting because I would have gone into this study thinking, well, the treadmill is probably easier than running on a track, right? The belt's moving. Sure, you have to propel yourself, but the belt moving would sort of would it take away some of the momentum? It's not like you have to propel all of your mass forward. You're really just propelling it and lifting it up. But in order to make progress moving forward, the, the belt is doing some of that for you. I would have expected that the treadmill would have been easier than the track. Clearly, that's not the case, which is actually quite interesting. The big uh, finding of this study is in comparing running versus walking. Running required more energy than walking did in every case. For men on the treadmill, more energy running. Women on the treadmill, more energy running. Men on the track, more energy running. Women on the track, more energy running. Same amount of work, not done in the same way. What do I mean by not done in the same way? Think about how you walk versus how you run. What's different? Why would energy expenditure be greater running? Like you have more, you need more resources and strength for running. Okay. Okay, that's true. Yeah, so being that you have to achieve a higher steady state, your O2 deficit would be greater. So that would accentuate the total cost of exercise. That's true. And your epoch would be greater. And your epoch would 
probably also be greater. I don't have that information to say yes it is or not, and I can't remember what it said. What I'll leave you with is I want you to compare that in lab. Look at your epoch running versus walking and see if that's the case. I would tend to agree with you. But what about the mechanics of running versus walking? What's different about running versus walking? Okay, using your arms. You don't use your arms as much while you're walking, so that would increase energy expenditure. What else? Breathing muscles may be more forceful. Core and torso trying to maintain balance as you move side to side. Um, you've got shoulder, you got arms. Yeah, we talked about those shoulders uh, flexing and extending. Also, think about how um, your calf and leg muscles are working. You're lifting, you're vaulting your body weight in the air and forward as you're running, whereas you're not doing that walking. More musculature is engaged in the legs, more in the core and torso. The arms are engaged. Um, muscles of balance are probably more active. So the mechanics of running are or necessarily require more energy than uh, the mechanics of walking. That's what you should see to spoil lab for you. But I would have thought running and walking, same amount of work, it should be similar. Um, I'm going to power through. We got a video that's going to be kind of a break. So I know we normally do a break, but there's a video that's seven minutes long that I want to get through that will kind of be a break anyways. And I want to jump to the end uh, because we're almost done. I want to talk about some of these alternative therapies or cures for diabetes. I talked about it being a spectrum and you have to walk forward or walk back. You can't take leaps and bounds. But I want to touch on these ideas that there might be a way to circumvent that or um, leverage new technological developments that help or might help vault you more in one direction than the other. The first are extreme alterations in energy balance. Extreme alterations in energy balance. And this paper was boldly titled, Reversal of Type 2 Diabetes. This is now an older paper, eight years old. I remember when I first found this, it was like one or two years after it was released. Really radical approach. Individuals for eight weeks ate 600 kcals per day. So in context, um, you see all the nutritional facts standardized to a 2,000 kcal per day diet, which is a small-ish person, 2,500, 2,800 for a moderately sized person. Um, 600 kcals per day is a fraction of that. That's very little food. For eight weeks, people ate 600 kcals per day blood glucose was normalized. This is reversal of type 2 diabetes. We see a progressive decline in weight, 15 kilograms lost in eight weeks, 35 pounds in two months, which is massive. That's a lot. After week one, blood glucose uh, dropped to normal levels. We see a progressive decline in liver triglycerides. So this is a way that we can get at the idea that um, tissues are laden with free fatty acids and triglycerides that might uh, contribute to that lipotoxicity uh, phenomenon that we talked about earlier. Normal glycemia, progressive decline over eight weeks in uh, hepatic or liver triglycerides, drastic loss in body weight, and what we would call a reversal in diabetes extreme energy restriction in this case, 600 kcals per day. Quote, unquote, cure. Let me one-up that. 382 days <coughs> of fasting. 382 day fast. This is uh, in Scotland. One patient that over 382 days would take multivitamins and water, went from 456 pounds to 180. Notice this is more than a year. 382 days, the year is 365 days. 382 days fast with regular doctor supervision, and you have over the course of the entire fast various levels of 
glucose on the top. You can see that progressively drop and stabilize. Many other different minerals and ions, calcium, etc. Afterwards, five years after the fast, this fellow, uh, his weight remains at 196 pounds. The, if you ask me this without there being a paper to back it up, I'd say you're crazy. This is impossible. 382-day fast. Clearly some benefits, massive weight loss, normalization of blood glucose. Some other less easy to describe benefits are shown here. They couldn't take fecal collections because or evacuation was infrequent, 37 to 48 days between stool samples near the end of the fast, which is going to come back into play later on. Some added benefits. To this. So massive reduction in calories, major disruption in energy balance, and then this idea of stool samples leads really nicely into this next, uh, this next um, topic. Brief video here, which I find is really interesting, seven minutes long, but it talks about the idea of um, how stool samples might actually be central to the idea of uh, diabetes, insulin resistance, and uh, obesity. On your phone, in your water bottle. We're talking about bacteria. On your hands, under your water, and literally everywhere else on top of you too. Not water, omnipresent at any moment, and there is nothing we can do about it. So millions of years ago, we made a pact. We give them shelter and food, and in turn, they work for us. But the more we learn about this partnership, the more it looks like a cold war. Inside our mother's womb, humans start out sterile. When we're born and traveling through the birth canal, Billions of our mother's bacteria cover every single part of our bodies. This is an essential part of human health. Children born via C-section have a higher rate of asthma, immune diseases, and even leukemia. So our bodies do not only accept the invasion of microorganisms, they welcome it. Over millions of years, we co-evolved to make the best of our relationship. Mother's milk, for example, contains special sugars that are meant to feed and support certain groups of microbes, work as a decoy for others, and help to modulate the immune system. It takes up to two years until a healthy microbe community has formed. Every human has their own unique microbiome made up of bacteria, viruses, 
these complex systems inside our bodies interact? Will we are starting to see how much our microbiome actually influences us and our behavior. Take depression, for example. Healthy rats fed microbes from the guts of depressed people began showing anxiety-like behavior and symptoms that look like depression. And in early 2017, a study linked the microbiome to intelligence by connecting a certain setup of bacteria in newborns with better motor and language skills. But it might also influence our daily lives. Tests with fruit flies showed that their microbiome influenced what kinds of food they craved. This could mean your microbes are able to tell your brain which food it should give them, although this is not a one-way street. The seed for our microbiome comes from our mother, but how it develops and changes is determined by what we eat. The organisms in our gut feed on different things. Some like fibers and leafy greens, others go for sugars and starches, and some love greasy fries and butter. Our gut is like a garden in which we constantly decide what will grow and blossom. If we eat healthily, we breed bacteria that like healthy food. If we eat a lot of fast food, then we breed fast food loving bacteria. Life is hard, so we can get trapped in a vicious circle. You have a stressful time and eat lots of burgers and fries and pizza. This is awesome for fast food bacteria. They multiply and multiply and take up space from vegetable loving bacteria. But even worse, they send signals to the brain to continue what it's doing. This makes you want more fast food, which breeds more fast food bacteria, which makes you crave fast food, and so on. This kind of self-reinforcing cycle can play a huge role in obesity. But it's important to stress that you can fight this process and reverse it by eating healthily and breeding more good bacteria. Beyond weight gain, our microbiome has also been linked to other serious diseases like autism, schizophrenia, and cancer. One of the earliest symptoms of Parkinson's is actually gut problems. If your body is overrun with bacteria that harm you, there is often only one solution. You bring in an army of good guys. That's very easy. You just transplant some healthy poop. You do that by literally transferring poop from a healthy person into your gut. This method is already used to cure diarrhea that's caused when C. difficile bacteria take over a gut microbiome. But we just don't know enough about the complex gut of their work here yet. For example, a transplant from an overweight donor cured a woman's diarrhea, but contributed to her obesity down the line. This caused some waves, and another study tried to reverse the effect. Poop transplants from slim people to obese ones gave them a more diverse microbiome and made them less sensitive to insulin, both things that also happen when people lose weight. We need to do a lot more science to really understand how our microbes make us healthy or sick. But whether we like it or not, we need our microbiome and <coughs> it needs us. We'll never have our bodies to ourselves, but we have gained a powerful ally, if we can just keep the peace. So that was a, a nice long-winded ramp up to help you understand it's not your fault that you crave donuts and pizza and fries. It's your bacteria, right? And it's true. Fecal transplants are one of these promising diabetes cures. And I'm going to show you the... Oh, yeah, I'm trying to coin this term. Do you think that'll work? <laughs> I'm going to show you the results from this study, 2017, that uh, took lean gut bacteria, transplanted it into obese individuals that helped improve insulin sensitivity. What I'm showing you here are uh, a sham transplant versus a real transplant. And so this is one control method in a study like this. You, you're going to know if you've gotten a transplant or not. So in the control condition, the transplant is your own bacteria or self-infusion. Not that you're doing it yourself, but it's a self-infusion. And then the donor transplant in an obese individual that's receiving uh, really lean uh, bacteria. What we're looking at here is glucose uptake or an in index of insulin sensitivity. The higher, the better. And there's clearly no effect in the self-infusion group. There shouldn't be. There's only, uh, you're maintaining the status quo. But we see this really nice uptick uh, 
in insulin sensitivity at six weeks for those individuals that got the lean bacteria. And if you dive into the uh, results of the paper, it's only the individuals that had a really low diversity. You could predict who was going to respond by whether they had a lot of those fast food loving or one kind of bacteria. If they had a really low diversity, then the infusion with the lean bacteria, which presumably increased diversity, uh, made them more insulin sensitive. So that's great news for those individuals. It's not great news for everyone, and it's not really even great news for those individuals if you're not into this whole idea of a fecal transplant. For all of that trauma that must have gone into this process, too, the unfortunate news is that at 18 weeks, everything was back to normal. So it really highlights the interplay here between, sure, there's signs of a cure, but just having a fecal transplant doesn't automatically change your routine and habits and lifestyle, and if those persist, then you'll probably edge out those healthy bacteria again over the course of some amount of time, and that seems to be at least 18 weeks in this case. So we see insulin sensitivity improve, but then if nothing else improves, this can't be the only thing that uh, ameliorates the situation for these individuals. So, quote unquote, diabetes cure. Uh, that's it for this section. Do you want to see a couple summary points? Yeah, let's do that. So, today we talked about obesity and diabetes as a spectrum, a lot like other modern chronic disease. And I'm introducing the idea of energy balance as what will push you up and down that spectrum. So, we can modify that balance with food or exercise or both. We can calculate food calories and exercise calories really precisely to get a sense of are we in balance or not. You'll recall from last class that the persistent positive surplus of energy might uh, lead to dysfunction, specifically insulin resistance through lipotoxicity and or mitochondrial dysfunction. I tend to think they both kind of go together. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction might be the, uh, the, the wrench in the works that actually confers the reduced function during insulin signaling. And therefore, unclogging the sink is really important to create a persistent deficit. Whether it's only through eating less, whether it's through eating less and exercise, or whether it's only through exercise, it doesn't matter as long as there is a negative energy balance. And not only for a day or even a week, but doing it persistently and making it part of a healthy lifestyle or routine should unclog the sink, turn the faucet off, and help some of that water drain um, out of the sink. And then lastly, what we just saw, there's a promise for some cures. The idea of an extreme disruption to energy balance just takes the idea of persistent energy deficit to the next degree. That's one way that a cure might be approached for some individuals that are highly at risk. Or there's other, um, not risky, but not proven, certainly, uh, certainly showing some promise, um, but messy therapies that might provide some uh, avenues for curing diabetes and other chronic diseases down the road as we unlock more and understand more about the microbiome. Excuse me. So any questions before we call it for the day? I think that's uh, just in time to finish everything off, and then we'll talk about hypertension and start getting into cardiovascular stuff on Thursday.